Humanity is reimagined as a cancer, something inherently evil, the mere existence of which is a burden on the world. This, unsurprisingly, encapsulates the modern environmental movement's position almost perfectly. Human life is no longer something to be treasured, but something to be measured in carbon and then reduced. In the man-made global warming myth, humans are merely an obstacle to the proper functioning of nature. In the eugenicist fantasy, the earth is saved when people die. In both ideologies, if they really are separate, the ultimate genocide becomes thinkable. Now, the leaders of the world are meeting in Copenhagen to decide on the future of your world, of my world, of the world of our children and grandchildren. They are proposing a reorganization of the world's economy. Punishing austerity is being urged in all corners. Groups of population control eugenicists are now arguing for carbon offsets to be used to stop the developing world from having children. The choir of madness is growing by the day, and everything seems set to reach an intolerable crescendo. And then, in the darkest hour, just as it seems the eugenicists are about to take over, along comes an insider, a hero, at the University of East Anglia, to leak the emails and documents with which the entire man-made global warming myth is exposed, and the carbon reduction agenda is delegitimized. It is not always popular to stand against a great injustice, but it is always right. There is basically a movement among the elite to eradicate what they deem the inferior classes, and that's the inferior social classes, racial classes, ethnic classes, more or less everyone who isn't up to their standards. And after eradicating those classes, what they aim to do is genetically engineer themselves to such a high level that the remaining population that they permit to exist beneath them will never have the power to overthrow them, essentially. At the end of history. If, if climate change is, uh, is ever mentioned, no one notices the elephant in the room over population. So less people equals less emissions. Simples uh, don't have too many babies. Well, of course, it doesn't just end at not having too many babies if what we are actually talking about here is population reduction. Uh, so perhaps this uh, uh, needs to be taken into account, the, the, uh, the results of, of the type of policy that we seem to be increasingly pursuing uh, and very keen to pursue through Extinction Rebellion and so on. Uh, that has consequences. Uh, and of course, if we reduce the birth rate, uh, then we have to do something about uh, elderly people, Brian, and then the question is, what do we do with them? Uh, well, I'm going to say the, the, the politicians already know what to do with elderly people, which is why we're seeing a massive increase in the death rate of elderly people within the NHS and the care system. There's a lot of information still to come out about this, but we know that uh, data around the Midstaffs Hospital, for example, was a was the tip of the iceberg with a number of elderly people dying unnecessarily within the NHS and that hasn't uh, declined with so-called changes in the Liverpool, Liverpool Care Pathway for example we know that the death rate has actually dramatically increased and is still increasing so uh, people who are concerned of the of the about the NHS and the care system say that we're already seeing a policy to get rid of elderly people. Again, this is not by coincidence, this is by design. Someone who hit the no nail right on the head about this subject very recently is PreviousCorporateReport.com guest Jeffrey Tucker, who wrote this essay, The Socialists Always Come for the Kids, Eventually. And I don't think he even probably realizes exactly how right he is in this article, but he does hit the nail squarely on the head, pointing out AOC in her sweet potato video makes a passing remark that suggests some anxiety about whether people ought to have kids. And he goes on to relate this to the anarchy of human production and 
ultimately how eugenics is still with us and how ultimately one thing that a central planner cannot abide is the anarchy of human production. People deciding when and how to have children and having children on their own without state intervention. Oh, we can't have that. We're going to have to start limiting people's human production, which is why it always comes down to that in the most hardcore of hardcore centrally planned economies like in communist China and other places. There will be literal laws on the books about how and when and how many children you can have. And do you not think that is coming? Do you not think this is where this conditioning, this climate grief propaganda is going? Because I'm telling you, it is. In fact, if you've been following the news lately, it's already here. Sticking with the environment, there is a growing group of women who say they are on a birth strike. They're too scared, they say, to have children because of what they call ecological Armageddon. Let's meet some of them in an exclusive TV interview. Blythe Papino, who is here, she's the founder of Birth Strike, and Alice Brown, who's 25, and says she's so scared about the future of the planet, it's actually actually debilitating for her. Welcome, both of you. Um, why are you on Birth Strike, Blythe? Um, because I'm terrified, um, and of that's what? putting it mildly. Um, so. Our planet is in a kind of collapse. The natural world is collapsing around us, and that's actually happening right now. Um, and I'm so disappointed by um, the response by our authorities to this crisis, um, and so freaked out by it. Um, everything that I've read, um, that I've, I've basically last year, I came to the decision that I couldn't bring a child into that. Um, and I was asking around um, people that I know, put it a little bit out on Facebook and realised actually quite a lot of other people are making this decision. Mm. Um, yeah, and so we realised it was really, really important to, to tell the public that there are people out there that are so scared about this that they feel that they can't actually have a family. And you have come to the same conclusion, Alice? Yeah, I have. I'm... Um I mean, each day for me is is a struggle. I re I really do just. I'm so depressed. I feel so hopeless over how you know. I'm reading just in the last couple of months, even that you know, insect numbers are plummeting so fast. It now threatens the collapse of nature. Mm -hmm. That we're losing biodiversity. We're not losing. We're destroying biodiversity mm -hmm. so quickly that that threatens our food and, and the UN have said that that could lead to the risk of our own extinction. David Attenborough going on TV to say the collapse of civilization could come from this and I know that is so hard to really sit with and take in um, but I have done that and that has led to um, just a fear that I've never felt before and, and my decision for being on birth strike mostly has come from not wanting to pass that fear on to someone else. If, if we're in this situation now, you know, even since my parents had me, we've destroyed 60% of, of life on this planet. What would that be like when my child's my age? Will there be 10% left? That's not just to do with being, um, you know, a nature wildlife enthusiast like I am. That's actually, that's dangerous mm. as well. It's a life and death it is. situation. That's right. There is now something called the birth strike movement, which is encouraging women to refuse to have children because they believe the earth is in crisis due to climate change. Climate grief to literal carbon eugenics in one easy step. I really hope that this sounds familiar to you, because if it does, then thank you for having paid attention to me and what I've been screaming about for a literal decade now. It was a decade ago that I made my first video on carbon eugenics, trying to tie this together using the historical parallel that is there. In fact, it's not a parallel. It is literally the history of the modern environmental movement and the carbon eugenics movement from the literal eugenicists of old. I traced that history very carefully in why big oil conquered the world for those who didn't see it. It's a literal through line that goes from eugenics in the late 19th, early 20th century to the environmental movement and climate change in the late 20th and early 21st century towards technocracy, which will be the future of the 21st century. Uh, it, it's, it's right there in black and white, and this is how it's done, tying this thread through. It's all about 
directing the human population and controlling the human population in every sense, including, of course, the most literal sense now of literally encouraging people voluntarily, of course. It's all up to you, but you're going to die. The Earth is going to die in 12 years because we've just screwed everything up with our carbon sins, and every child that you put onto this planet is 568 tons of carbon dioxide per year added to our collective carbon guilt. And I know I'm not just pulling that number out of thin air. I'm going, of course, by the IPCC and its report on the world's climate trends, which just happens to note that having one child less per family will save 58.6 tons of CO2 per year. Because when I look at my children running around, growing up, learning, playing in the park, I think, Oh, look at all that CO2 they're putting out onto this planet. Oh, it's so horrible. This is insanity, and it has to stop. We have to collectively snap out of it. And those of you who are awake and aware and understand this propaganda for what it is should be screaming from the rooftops about this. Do not go quietly into the good night as they literally march us into this technocratic eugenics enslavement grid in the name of the climate grief propaganda that they're shoving down our throats from birth with the Green Reaper and everything else. This is the game for all the marbles and unfortunately it is an exceptionally effective game that plays on our most fundamental psychological weaknesses. There's a lot more to be said about this, but of course, please do follow the notes, uh, follow the links from the show notes for this video so that you can discover more about this and really delve into the nitty gritty. Go to the wrong kind of green, read about the manufacturing of Greta Thunberg, learn about the billions and billions and ultimately trillions of dollars that are on the line for big name, big stakes players in the economy to manufacture this, this new reality of climate grief and climate guilt, and climate sin, and climate tithing that is all being stitched together for us, and ultimately, of course, climate eugenics, which is the next stage in this game. I cannot stress enough how important it is, and if you have been affected by this propaganda conditioning, or you know people who are, and are under the psychosis of this climate grief, know that this is a very well-understood psychological phenomenon called learned helplessness, where if you put someone in a situation and then tell them no matter what you do, no matter how you struggle, no matter anything that you do, you're still going to die a horrible death or you're going to receive pain or shock in some manner, well, that person is eventually going to give up. And that is where they want the population to give up. If you would like to overcome that, might I humbly suggest that you also take a look at the link in the show note that I'll put there to Overcoming Learned Helplessness, which was an episode of Corporate Report Radio back in the day. And I will have more to say on that particular subject in the near future. But uh, as I say, this is within my little... DACA, 1963. It's a day much like any other in Dhaka. The streets are crowded, dirty, squalid, smelly, and absolutely swarming with people, lying in the streets, coiled in the gutters. Into that swarm of people steps a most unlikely figure. Wearing his drip-dry suit and hugging his briefcase, he sticks out from the crowd. Surveying the scene, he shakes his head ever so slightly before remarking, half to himself and half to his traveling companion, well, that's the problem, isn't it? It's a scene that has played itself out many times. A Western tourist overwhelmed by the bustling crowds of the Indian subcontinent. But this was no mere tourist passing time on his holiday. This was John D. Rockefeller III, grandson of oil baron John D. Rockefeller. And, armed with the unimaginable wealth, power, and influence that his family name bestowed on him, he was on a mission to do something about the problem of overpopulation. Rockefeller approached that mission as a representative of the Population Council, a group that he himself had founded in 1952 to address the problem in Dhaka and elsewhere. On its surface, 
The Population Council was a straightforward organization with a straightforward task to support medical and scientific research into the question of the growing human population. But the dark history of the Council and its guiding philosophy reveal Rockefeller's true interest in this problem and its ultimate solution. John D. Rockefeller III, or JDR III as he was known to the constellation of researchers, businessmen, politicians, diplomats, and royals in the orbit of the Rockefeller family, had decided early on how to make proper use of the formidable money and power at his disposal by controlling the population of the planet. In 1934, the then 28-year-old JDR III had written a letter to his father, John D. Rockefeller Jr., about the Rockefeller Foundation's research into birth control and related questions, declaring, I have come pretty definitely to the conclusion that it is the field in which I will be interested, for the present at least, to concentrate my own giving. JDR III was nothing if not a man of his word. After commissioning a Rockefeller Foundation fact-finding mission to Asia to report on the threat of the growing third world population, he organized a conference of the top medical and demographic researchers of the era to discuss, as the very title of the meeting termed it, population problems. From that meeting emerged the idea for an organization, the Population Council, to guide the development of the burgeoning field of population and fertility research. JDR III personally donated $1.35 million of his own money to found the council and provide its initial operating expenses. Like his father and grandfather before him, Rockefeller had learned to use philanthropy and largesse as a mask for his true intention, control. But that mask slipped when he penned a draft of the council's charter revealing the organization's true purpose. The council, according to JDR III, would promote research and apply existing knowledge to help develop such changes in the attitudes, habits, and environmental pressures affecting the life of human beings, so that within every social and economic grouping, parents who were above the average in intelligence, quality of personality, and affection will tend to have larger-than-average families. Thomas Perrin, the former Surgeon General of the United States and Council co-founder, warned against including such a blunt admission in the Council's mission statement. Such questions arise as the following, he warned. Who is to determine the parents who are above average in affection? Also, who would decide the persons having better than average personality? Frankly, the implications of this, while I know they were intended to have a eugenic implication, could readily be misunderstood as a Nazi master race philosophy. I have, therefore, recast this paragraph. The line was dropped from the final version of the charter. In truth, however, that sentence had not been written by JDR III himself. Instead, it had been copied word for word from the back cover of Eugenical News, the central publication of the American eugenics movement. This was no mere accident. Frederick Osborne, one of the co-founders of the council and its first president after Rockefeller stepped down in 1957, was also the president of the American Eugenics Society. When the Population Council was founded, both Osborne and the American Eugenics Society he directed formally moved their operations into the council's New York office, with the Eugenics Society now taking its funding directly from Rockefeller's Population Council grant. The Population Council was the Eugenics Society under another name. Eugenics this was the guiding vision of JDR III and the Rockefeller family's philanthropy. A vision that cast the Rockefellers and their fellow oligarchs as superior families, fit by very virtue of their wealth and success to guide the course of world events. The power to determine who was fit to breed and who was too poor to pass on their genes.